that? Can you tell? Is that just how loud my voice is? Hello, check, check. Oh yeah, we're on. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne Arden. I'm a volunteer with the okay. Sierra Club, uh, chair of the Transportation Committee here in New York City. And um, we're very pleased for you to join us this evening. Um, this is an event during New York City Climate Week, which has been going on since 2009 and overlaps with the UN General Assembly Week. And uh, given that this relates to the UN, uh, we're talking about an exciting new bill that has been introduced recently in the New York City Council. Um, New York City is a signatory of a treaty, or a rather a promise, that was signed at, uh, in Glasgow uh, last November. And that is by 2035, 100% of New York City's zero emission uh, vehicles will be zero emission. But that was a promise, that was not law, and it applied to cars and vans, not all vehicles. So the bill we'll talk about tonight is more comprehensive than that. Um, but before we do that, um, I'd like to introduce Professor Peter Marcatulio. Uh, we're in uh, a CUNY facility, City of New York. Um, Professor Marcatulio is professor of the, of, in the Department of Geography and the Environmental Science. He's director of the Institute for Sustainable Cities at Hunter College, uh, City University of New York. He's held positions at the United Nations University, the University of Tokyo, and Columbia University. His research interests focus on environmental change and urbanization. Currently, he's a member of the New York City Panel on Climate Change and co-chair of the energy chapter for the New York State Climate Assessment. So he is an expert in this topic and will give us a little bit of insight as to what's going on and how climate change affects New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for that introduction. So we're honored to have you all here tonight at the CUNY Graduate Center for the Climate Week New York City panel entitled Reducing New York City's Transportation Emission Discussing Bill Intro 0279-2022, New York City's Zero uh, uh, Electric Vehicle Bill. The panel is sponsored by the Sierra Club and hosted by CUNY. I'd like to acknowledge our special guest tonight, uh, Council Members Keith Powers, who represents New York City's Council District Number Four, and Council Member Carlina Rivera, who represents uh, the Second Council District. We're delighted that you can come tonight, spend tonight to speak with us. So my job here is to introduce you to CUNY a little bit and climate research at CUNY, and then provide sort of a very big overview on, um, on the, concerning the issues at hand, which is the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. I'll attempt to do these tasks in about 10 minutes, which will allow us to focus on the main event, the discussion of EVs in New York City. Okay, so let's talk about CUNY. CUNY has a long and distinguished history. In fact, we have, uh, we're, we're celebrating our 175th anniversary it is the nation's leading urban public university. We house 25 institutions in, which serve 243,000 degree-seeking students. There's another 250,000 students that are involved in continuing education and certificate programs. That's 500,000 students altogether. CUNY has about 1,400 academic programs, 200 majors leading to associate bac baccalaureate degrees, and 800 graduate degrees. There are 7,000 full-time faculty at CUNY and another 13,000 part-time faculty. Given the size of the institution and time constraints, it's not possible for me to highlight all of the research, particularly climate research that goes on at, the, at, at CUNY. Um, however, I can say a few things. Um, right. So we are home to about 100 uh, research institutions, and these research institutions uh, uh, range in, in size and focus. Uh, they touch everything from aging to applied sciences to ethnic studies to food studies, et cetera. And many of these issues 
uh, uh, intersect uh, with climate change. I was at a conference uh, last week, uh, one of the many CUNY conferences on climate change, and I listed some of the institutions that had representatives at this particular conference. There's the Environmental Science Initiative up at the Advanced Science Research Center located on CCNY campus. There's the Food Policy Institute located in the School of Public Health, the Science and Resilience Center at Jamaica Bay, which is affiliated with Brooklyn College, the Center for Remote Sensing and Earth System Studies at New York College of Technology, and of course, my institute, or the institute I direct, uh, the Institute for Sustainable Cities at Hunter College. Okay, so that was a brief introduction um, to some of the uh, institutes and activities at CUNY. Now let's talk about the big picture. The introduction, this is an introduction to the ch uh, challenge of climate change mitigation. So again, here's the big picture, and I think this slide says it all. The global energy supply, the primary energy supply in 1970 was just above 200 exajoules. It's now over 600 exajoules. And the increase in energy supply has been um, largely through fossil fuels, coal, crude oil, and natural gas. If you look at the shares of each of these uh, uh, different components, you'll see that they hold and they continue to hold at least 80% of total global energy supply. On the bottom, you'll see a little sliver of pink that includes the uh, so, uh, solar and other sort of new, what we call new traditional, or, or I'm sorry, new uh, renewables. So the real message here is that um, trends in energy use are monolithically increasing with fossil fuels maintaining a dominant share of total. Um, so the result has been an increase in carbon emissions. This graph is from the Global Carbon Project and it, it, it includes what has happened last year. Um, you'll see a little dip at the end and then it jumps back up almost in a V shape. Between in 19, and, I'm sorry, 2020 was the largest decrease in emissions ever experienced globally since the industrial um, uh, revolution. And then the following year was the largest single annual increase. So what we can see here is that the, um, the carbon emissions are following the, um, the, the use of fossil fuels. Now, people want to know how, how much we had dropped during the, during the pandemic, um, particularly as the world went through a series of lockdowns across you know, different continents, whether it was North America or Europe or, or, or Asia. Well, the results suggest, or results of ver uh, various studies suggest that uh, emissions fell by about 5%. Um, in 2021, however, the emissions jumped another 4.9%, sort of wiping out any of those potential um, uh, uh, windfalls from, from, that, uh, 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 from, from the pandemic. The main message here is that the, um, the emissions are increasing, that um, it's clear that uh, something like the pandemic well, is, or, or, or an economic shutdown is not nearly the answer that we need, we need all types of policies, particularly that deal with efficiencies and shifting measures towards renewables to, uh, to, to bring down what we, what we would like to do is to get to 1.5. So what does that mean? Now we can see. Okay. All right. So for the U.S., um, we see the same sort of um, uh, 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 trends that we see at the global scale. Um, and here's, what, here's something that's very really interesting. The U.S. emissions at the, um, at the national level have been dropping since about 2007. And this is largely due to structural changes in the energy system itself, including efficiencies. 
as well as uh, this shift from coal, as you can see, the, the pink line has dropped dramatically, to natural gas. But here's where we want to be at the global scale. This is a, um, a diagram from uh, the UN IPCC report 1.5. It suggests that what, in order to reach the goal of re keeping emissions at 1.5 degrees or less, we need to basically stop emitting and, and we start to reduce our emissions after, uh, after they peaked in 2020 and bring them down subsequently 45 percent by 2030 and then even had, have net zero emissions by 2050. Certainly, certainly a huge task. When we look at the city, we see that the city has followed largely what the U.S. Uh, trends have been. We see a decrease over the last, um, uh, let's say, 15 years of about 25 percent. And we could also see here that there is a significant portion of citywide emissions that are transportation related. And these are not the, the government um, related emissions. This is what th uh, these emissions look like. But they also have been dropping, which is really a, a, a good sign. And they actually make up a smaller percentage of, of total when compared to the citywide. However, they are significant. We're talking about something like uh, 250,000 tons of carbon e every year. And if you change those 250,000 tons of carbon into uh, gallons, both in terms of, of uh, 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 diesel and gasoline, that that amount will fill up about 45 Olympic swimming pools every year. So reducing this is, 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 f is not insignificant. And how we should we do this? Well, I, I claim that every single policy across all types of technologies, across all types of sectors, need to be addressed and we, ne we need a what I call tenacious incrementalism so that we can reduce emissions. It's, it's the good fight. And that in terms of CUNY, um, and with an eye on what we are very interested in, we want to do this in a way that is environmentally just for all New Yorkers. And with that, I'll turn this over, or turn this back to Wayne so they can discuss the ZEV bill. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, just a couple of comments to frame this for our next discussion. Um, if you look at emissions from transportation in the United States, about 27% come from transportation and 25% from the electrical power sector. It's fairly recent that transportation emissions has be, have become the largest source of emissions in the United States. In New York City, um, transportation emissions are the second largest source. So buildings account for 70% of emissions in New York City, and transportation accounts for 25%. Um, New York City has made good progress in tackling emissions from buildings with the Climate Mobilization Act that was passed in 2019. But it's fair to say New York City has not made visible progress tackling the second largest source of emissions, which is from transportation. So that's why the need for the bill that we're about to discuss is so urgent. Um, and these, the, f the figures that uh, complement what Peter said, we're now up to 419 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere pre uh, the Industrial Revolution, and that was uh, only 277. So. If we're going to meet those UN goals of 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase, of, of limiting, limiting climate to, uh, increase to that, we need to address emissions from all sources, including transportation. Um, it's an assumption of today's talk that zero emission vehicles do that. There are many, many studies that have confirmed this that look at the life cycle emissions of zero emission vehicles versus traditional internal combustion engi uh, engine vehicles. I'll just mention one, but there are many. 
Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists every two years publishes statistics about zero emission vehicles. Uh, right now, the average EV in New York City gets 93 miles per gallon. In upstate New York, it's 247 miles per gallon equivalent. So they very much reduce lifetime emissions versus internal combustion engines. So that's, uh, that's an assumption behind today's discussion. Uh, now I'd like to introduce to you um, two of the council members who are taking the lead in this fight that we are confronting against climate change. I'd first like to introduce to you council member Keith Powers. He represents uh, New York City's Council District 4, which covers a good part of central and eastern Manhattan, including where we are right now. Uh, he currently serves as majority leader of the city council and chair of the rules, privileges, and elections committee. Uh, during his time in office, council member Powers has introduced and passed legislation to make it easier to run for office, to prevent housing discrimination, broaden sexual harassment protections, and protect small business. In his first term, council member chaired the criminal justice committee where he worked to overhaul the criminal justice system and change the culture of our city's jails. He's played a key role in stewarding the vote to close Rikers Island and has passed legislation to eliminate bail fees. In the current legislative suggestion that extends from 2022 to 2023, uh, he has introduced 33 bills. Um, and he's a graduate of the University of Dayton and here, the CUNY Graduate Center, a lifelong New Yorker and third generation resident in Peter Cooper Village in Stuyvesant Town. One second. And also, I would like to introduce Council Member Carolina Rivera. She rep rep represents the second district, which I understand begins maybe a half a block from here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and extends uh, south, covering a good part of eastern Manhattan up to the financial district. Uh, she currently serves as the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, during her time in office, Council Member Rivera has introduced and passed legislation related to sexual harassment, immigration, criminal justice reform, affordable housing, small business survival, and bicycle safety. And what's uh, near and dear to our hearts at the Sierra Club, she's co-sponsored local Law 97, the Green Deal for New York, to reduce building emissions citywide, as I mentioned earlier. Um, she's been a champion for mass transit and, and bicyclists to reduce car congestion and pollution. And to make New York City a leader in the energy transition, Council Member Rivera co-sponsored a plan to transform Rikers Island into a renewable energy hub and supported the divestment of the city's pension away from fossil fuel companies. So in the current session, Council Member Rivera has introduced 41 bills. She is a graduate of Marist College with a BA in journalism and uh, also is a native New Yorker having attended local schools her entire life. So in summary, we have two very prominent members of the City Council with us this afternoon. Uh, both are native New Yorkers and together they are working to take a lead in tackling climate change and specifically introduce this bill relating to zero emission vehicles. So with that, for the next 45 minutes or so, I'll, uh, I'll walk over and, and we'll have a conversation about some of the issues relating to um, the bill and to climate change at large. Okay. All right. I guess you can hear me. All right, so the first few questions are somewhat general in nature and then we'll go into more detail about the bill itself and we'll conclude again with uh, more speculative questions about climate change and, and what more broadly we and society can do. So as public servants, um, you both deal with a myriad of issues, housing, economic development, healthcare, public safety, transportation and human rights as your record uh, indicates. Um, how concerned are your constituents about pollution and climate change in general? And maybe uh, Council Member Power, since you're immediately to my left, um, yep. maybe you could start. I think highly concerned. Um, you know, I think nationwide, but even included in the city, this has become such a bigger part of the conversation about uh, issues in policy. And of course, there's the real sort of everyday challenges that New Yorkers face, which is how to pay the rent and 
how to get to work safely and all, the, all those things. But at the sort of, I think, uh, in the larger conversation about what we are facing as a nation right now, when it comes to both uh, in the short and long-term challenges that we're seeing climate change contribute to, this is getting, I think, more resonating every day more with New Yorkers, but I do think sometimes they feel like it is so far away. It's Congress's challenge to do that or it's someone else's challenge. And so I think what we have both been trying to do is to bring that conversation home and with the Sierra Club and with other people here in the city, look for ways that we can do a better job of addressing this. But I think the challenge that we see every single day is that those immediate sort of um, you know, short-term challenges feel like the ones that we should be paying attention to, and we should, but we have to do that um, while at the same time looking at how to keep our city and our country and our globe uh, uh, safe from what, what looks like very long-term harm and challenges as well. Right. Council Member Rivera, how would you? Respond? Yeah, we have very engaged districts, I would say. Like our constituents are always asking us how they can participate and we receive inquiries and opinions from people that live in our communities asking you know, whether we're gonna support certain bills, whether or not we actually can introduce legislation in the city council to support other climate friendly uh, bills, even at the state and federal level. So it's also sending a message from the city council of more national and statewide policies that we support. And so our conversations will be everything from, you know, what we're doing to ban single use plastics to universal composting and making that more readily available to larger, more comprehensive historic pieces of legislation that we passed like the Climate Mobilization Act and Local Law 97. And you mentioned building emissions as, as, as the highest emitter uh, immediately followed by transportation. Uh, so we really try to look at also how we're in this very unique uh, city, right? The greatest city in the world where we also represent Manhattan in the central business district, very busy, and also a, a, a streetscape that is desperate for improvement. So mass transit, transportation specifically, is something that we should be the leader on. And so this bill and, and a number of others, including some of the initiatives that we're looking at on how to prioritize mass transit, how to create greener, transportation alternative friendlier uh, infrastructure like for cyclists or you know whatever you're kind of riding out there that's green uh, that's what we're trying to really put together as a council and we feel excited by the energy in this newer council uh, that is also looking to make this this sort of change and sometimes they're not the most popular um, and sometimes you have to look at it as was mentioned long-term planning and sustainability it feels like sometimes we're not moving fast enough. And then you think about what's coming next month and that's the 10 year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. So, you know, some things are in motion, but a lot of things are, are behind and we're certainly looking at other cities to learn and to figure out how we can move faster. You, you both referenced a great challenge, I think in general in politics of dealing with a very difficult long-term problem whose immediate effects aren't always visible. Um, and it's great to hear that there's enthusiasm in, in this, uh, this session about, about getting things done. That's really encouraging. And that's a perfect lead into the next question. The setup is a little bit long because it relates to Superstorm Sandy. So I wanna talk a little bit about what that did to New York City. Um, I was here as perhaps you were as well. Um, and so, um, as we all know, four of New York City's five boroughs are islands. And like other cities on the East Coast, New York City is highly vulnerable to rising sea levels. Um, NOAA is the, the uh, part of the US government that perhaps does the most research on this topic. Um, according to their 2022 sea level, a sea rise technical report, um, the sea rise will rise one foot by 2050 and it's highly likely to rise two feet by 2100, and it's already risen 1.1 feet since 1900. Um, and if I quote their language in the report, by 2050, moderate, which is typically damaging, flooding is expected to occur on average more than 10 times more frequently than it does today. And NOAA came out with a report in 2019 that's especially troubling for New Yorkers, and what that report states is that um, 
high tide flood days will increase in New York City um, faster than in Miami, faster than in San Francisco, two other cities that NOAA analyzed. Um, that, that's surprising that New York is, is that vulnerable. Um, and if we look at what, what Sandy did, uh, the 100 year flood zone includes many communities in New York City, in Brooklyn, Queens waterfront, the east and south shores of Staten Island, South Queens, Southern Brooklyn, Southern Manhattan and your districts. And by the end of the storm, 50, 51 square miles flooded. You know, that's 17% of the city's total land mass. And that exceeded the 100 year flood plain boundaries by 50%. So it was a massive storm with a huge impact. Um, New York City has estimated $19 billion worth of damage. NOAA estimated 70 billion in the region. And this was a, when it hit landfall, it wasn't a category one hurricane. It was a tropical storm combined with the nor'easter. So the problem is that with climate change, we're facing rising sea levels and more frequent and powerful storms. So given that we're on the 10 year anniversary of this, of this extraordinary event, extraordinary difficult event for New York City, um, in your travels around your districts, what are you hearing? What are you seeing on the radar as you, as you talk to folks? Um, Council member. Yeah, I, I, you mentioned a lot of the economic devastation, what we experience in terms of infrastructure damage and small businesses, but also the, the, the lives lost during Hurricane Sandy and, and the flooding that came right into our districts and uh, Council Member Powers and I uh, were there, and I mean, there are pictures that you can see of, of cars floating beside, you know, the very development where, where Keith grew up, and we had up to eight feet of flooding in many of these areas that we really just weren't expecting it. We weren't prepared. I would say if we had eight feet of water come into any part of New York City today, we would still be ill prepared. And you could even see that in our subway system, which is why. It's so deserving of massive investment, and I, and I know congestion pricing is hopefully one of the um, solutions to that issue. Uh, but we are trying to figure out how we can implement infrastructure where it's going to protect our communities for the next 100 years, and also that it's that it's social infrastructure, that it's whether it's for passive or active recreation, or it's a multi-purpose waterfront and. How do we also incorporate better utilized waterways? I mean, it's certainly going to take, you know, that, that short term planning for the immediate and then long term because this is going to continue to happen. And, and it was certainly Manhattan and all of the communities that you mentioned. And we're experiencing an investment right now of billions of dollars to, to rebuild and fortify our waterfront along the east side. But communities like Red Hook and Brooklyn are asking, you know, where's their plan? Where's their investment? And, and we're certainly looking at how we can do um, really more comprehensive plan for all five boroughs and creating just more focus within the agencies themselves in terms of the executive branch of government. And I, I would add, I mean, we live not yeah. far from each other and we both have lived right on, near, right on the waterfront and I remember very distinctly during, I mean, actually, I, I remember the year before, I think it was supposed to be Hurricane Irene. Yeah. Yes, it was. It didn't hit the way that I think everybody right. expected it to. So when Hurricane Sandy came, everybody was a little underprepared, not taking it seriously. And then we found out our city wasn't prepared structurally to tackle all the challenges there. And I have all these memories of Hurricane Sandy. I would like walking down on the waterfront as the water started to come over and realizing this was going to be a bigger deal than I think we all were prepared for. The power going out small businesses in the East Village and on the board of our districts that were trying to stay open or stay afloat because they had no power or the ones that did had the generators or helping the other ones out. The National Guard coming into Stuyvesant Town to help load supplies in and marching through. We forget that 10 years later and we can make the same mistakes if we choose to, to not do anything about it, to not prepare our waterfront, to not prepare our neighbors. And it's not fair to New Yorkers to have elected officials or leaders who are unwilling to tell them that we're going to make the choices and the hard choices to protect them against the next one. Whether you were in Rockaway or you were in these village in Stives and town, uh, neighborhoods got hit really hard. We are lucky because we and we and I've got, I've got, some, got some of our credit did some really hard stuff in her district to protect her constituents against what when that sea level happens. 
and we just actually, in my district and nearby, also started opening, reopening parks that got closed down so we could do the infrastructure stuff. We, those are hard decisions and people will be upset about them. And then we have colleagues of ours who represent parts of South Brooklyn who are saying, why is Manhattan getting that and we're not? Mm -hmm. So you live in this world of people being uh, upset that they're not getting it and then also those who are, I think, gonna be beneficiaries of that protection uh, uh, under recognizing those that, that, you know, recognizing some of the difficulties of it. So we are, we know it's happening, we know it's coming. And so um, we're gonna have to have more uh, big decisions ahead about how to protect people. We are not, we're a city of four of islands and every single borough is surrounded by water. This is a reality of living in the city we live in and we're not evacuating New York City anytime soon. So we have to start building infrastructure to protect ourselves against it. And then do all the other stuff, the policy choices to help ease that burden over the years. And that's why we're doing the legislation we're doing uh, alongside all the sort of bigger ticket infrastructure stuff because we have to kind of pair those two things together. Absolutely. Well, I think maybe that's a good segue into a specific set, the zero emissions vehicle bill that we're here to talk about that, that New York City could take that would be helpful in mitigating emissions. So uh, why don't we transition into talking about that? Um, so I'll just uh, introduce the bill a little bit, what's in it. Um, so this bill has several components to it. It has some purchasing deadlines, which are distinctive uh, for a bill of this type. It says that by July the 1st, 2025, New York City shall uh, purchase only zero emission vehicles in the light, du light duty and medium duty categories. And then by July the 1st, 2030, New York City will only purchase heavy duty uh, uh, zero emission vehicles. There's an exception to this and that's school buses and that's a very important exception because that relates to the health of, of New York City children. So for school buses, even though some school buses are heavy duty vehicles, some are medium duty, some are heavier duty, the deadline is earlier. It's the earlier deadline of July the 1st, 2025. And then the city must convert the entire fleet consisting of light duty vehicles, medium duty vehicles, and heavy duty vehicles by 2035. So that's the, the gist of the bill. Um, I'd like to add a, a couple of things. One is that um, American industry is supporting the deadlines of this bill. So if you look at the category of vehicles that New York City buys, uh, so general purpose vehicles, pursuit rated police cars, ambulances, school buses, street sweepers, fire trucks, today there are zero emission vehicle, vehicles for sale in each one of those categories. So New York City can go to multiple suppliers and buy these vehicles now, let alone by uh, July the 1st, 2025. And just yesterday, Mary Barra, who's the chair and CEO of GM, said that it's GM intent to sell only zero emission vehicles uh, in the light duty category by 2035. So we believe American industry is behind the deadlines of the bill. Um, and, and that's important for legislators to understand that it's eminently doable. Um, I should say that there is one uh, waiver in the bill that under certain circumstances, if, for example, charging infrastructure isn't quite there, an administrator could instead choose the next best option. But the way to think about this bill is that right now, the default is buying vehicles with internal combustion engines. And if this bill passes, the default will become no later than July the 1st, 2025, buying zero emission vehicles. So it would really change how the city procures vehicles. Um, before I turn to you, I just wanna quote the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times really underscored why we think this bill is necessary. Uh, in an April the 5th article, the New York Times wrote, despite the urgent need to move away from burning fossil fuels that accelerate climate change, the nation's largest cities embracing electric vehicles at a tortoise-like pace and lagging behind other major American cities, including San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seattle. So, um, what do you think about the bill? <laughs> You're the ones that we are like out in it. front promoting it. We like it. Uh, well, I'll give you context. I mean, Council Mayor Vera and I introduced this bill not terribly long ago. Uh, to, you know, the purpose here is to build them. The mayor de Blasio in the last term had made some announcements and some commitments in different points in time about to moving the municipal fleet to, uh, to electric vehicles, starting this process. 
I think a couple of things we recognize. One is we start to believe it's moving a little too slow. Two is administrations change, people change, and you really have to kind of hold administrations and change. You have to, with change, you have to really make sure they hold to their goals. And three is that we see that a way to do it that we think is a little bit different. And uh, obviously we have some in places in there where we have to be reasonable to accommodate uh, what's gonna be a transition. But I, I think that it's, re I think that one thing I've always said about like cities, especially major cities like New York City, is you can change the direction of a conversation, especially when you talk about your, like with the policy impact, and especially with your purchasing dollars and, your, and, how, you, and how you use procurement. Certainly when you add in other cities to that, when you add in Los Angeles, Seattle, San Francisco, who've done things like this, you start to see a real market movers and changes around how cities and states and country, the country is gonna operate when it comes to how we, uh, how we purchase and what vehicles are gonna be in the market. Uh, but, but to highlight something you, I think you had touched on a little bit is rather than just making slow progress through this and setting really far dates outward of when we would make the full transition, we're speeding that process up. We're saying so we'll not only add new vehicles now as the mayor wanted to, but we're gonna start setting some deadlines or when we only start doing that in three different categories. And there's a specific challenges that we don't, we also have to address is for instance, electric vehicle infrastructure and charging is missing right now in the city and there's a lot of sort of thought about how to do that. We can help do that by investing in that alongside of change, converting our fleet, which we'll later have to do which can then can become part of the entire conversation here in the city about how to move private vehicles and other delivery vehicles and things over there. And I think as you noted, we are heading in this direction as a country. The question is how fast and how, and how soon are we gonna make the real life? I think New York City can help push that conversation forward in a really important way. So that's, what we're, that's, what we're, that's, why, we're, that's why we did the bill, and that's why we're here. And I think so far we're seeing a good, uh, a good reception to that. So our, the, I mean, I think the point here is uh, let's not wait for uh, states that seem, seem far away. Let's not wait for the federal government to just do their part of it. We are a major uh, piece of this equation, especially in this country. Let's get us into that conversation to both educate people about the need for it and also to move our actual our city and our country in the direction that we are all talking about heading into, but doing it in a real way. Councilmember Rivera? Yeah, I mean, uh, the transportation sector is the single largest source of carbon emissions in the United States. And you mentioned that New York Times article that uh, New York City here, we have a very unique opportunity. We have the largest municipal fleet of vehicles at like roughly 30,000. And so when you look at what the capabilities are, the opportunity, and you know, we, we all want progress, we all wanna move along. Sometimes you have to codify that timeline. Sometimes y you have to put something, memorialize that says this is too important to not implement and to not hold you know, the city accountable. And so when you look at something like even our, our public city buses, we have roughly 5,900 public city buses. I think 15 of them run on our electric. So, you know, there's, there's so much room for improvement there. And when you mentioned the emissions, when we were tracking emissions in the year 2020, 70% of them were from buildings, but 25% of them were from transportation. And so when you're looking at how to move communities, when the majority of New Yorkers actually don't own a car, uh, we are reliant on public transportation, especially environmental justice communities where people who are low income and depend on that bus system who live in transit deserts, um, they're also subject to the pollution that exacerbates their symptoms of asthma. These are the families in public housing who now have mold from Hurricane Sandy creating these, these symptoms affecting their health who also need to have electric buses going through their communities, not buses that are running on these sort of traditional harmful uh, gases. And, and, and there's, there's things we can do and there's legislation that I've mentioned that runs from what you can do differently in your own home and on your block and in your community to what we can do as a city. And so I think we have that obligation is, is to lead. And, and we are, we're falling behind these West Coast cities. We have looked at their legislation and we know that we can move faster. We have the talent, we have the infrastructure and now it's the political will. 
So you've, you mentioned environmental justice. I know that's a topic that both of you have, have worked on and it's a, it's a worry. Um, you know, poor neighborhoods suffer disproportionately than uh, well-to-do neighborhoods. Um, and just maybe an aside, I mentioned to you, we, we, we um, at the Sierra Club had an opinion published last night in the Gotham Gazette with South Bronx Unite. And South Bronx Unite is very, very concerned about this issue, about the effect of pollution in, in the South Bronx. And this bill, one of the things it does is it addresses uh, medium duty, duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. And those vehicles are responsible for a disproportionate amount of pollution. Um, so in, in your rounds, when you've spoken to your constituents, um, talk a little bit about their, uh, this issue as it relates to your district. I mean, I, we collectively represent like the heart of Midtown and Manhattan and uh, more vehicles probably traveling through our districts and probably and most or all districts. So uh, I think the idea, the to sort of, I mean, I, and obviously part of the conversation around congestion pricing now and sort of BLT traffic. So I think for, I don't know if say for my district for sure, you know, trying to, you, you, get all, you get all the complaints, by the way. You get the traffic, the no, you get the normal everyday New York issues, but then obviously alongside that comes people's concerns about what they're breathing in, uh, what's in the air, and how, uh, you know, how it's an impact on their health. And so, and then we hear complaints about idling and all these other things that, you know, are sort of tied into being a New Yorker. So, I, I, look, I think there's a lot of support for this in my, in my district and in, in Manhattan in particular because of how much traffic we're dealing with, how many of these vehicles we're talking about are traveling through our districts in particular. And, uh, but it's not alone to us. It's, I think we're seeing a pretty resounding uh, chorus of support when it comes to the city council districts all over. Mm -hmm. and I, think it, I think people understand it no matter where you live. And whether you are in Manhattan or you are in any other borough, I think you understand how important it is to make sure that our, our municipal fleet here is, is contributing rather than taking, you know, we're, we're contributing to a healthier New York. Yeah, and I think these, these communities just have historically borne the brunt, right? They're low income. There are many who live in transit deserts that are dependent, that actually are very deserving and are owed uh, what I think is an important uh, first step in addressing this injustice, which is tackling emissions by reshaping the city fleet. You know, just by doing that, you are already uh, trying to address what has been, besides the, the lack of transportation, the, the harmful vehicles coming through people's communities. Um, you know, for those who don't own a vehicle, who live in areas, and there are parts of Manhattan, believe it or not, that don't have a ton of transportation, you know, just moving us away from cars as well. I mean, that's also the point of congestion pricing. That's why, you know, Keith and I were really trying to move towards a more livable city and re redesigning our streets, and every time we repave a road or we repaint a street, that's an opportunity to redesign it for electric vehicles, for busways, for, you know, whether you're, uh, those, you're on a little scooter, you're on your bicycle, I mean, active transportation, people-powered mobility has to also be a part of the conversation. And those shared streets, that's who should be prioritized. So if we could really just look at our city fleet, move it towards electric, and then go towards really a whole city that um, is not so behind. I mean, what, what we have in terms of electric vehicles registered in New York State, I think, is in the single digits. I mean, right now you have half a million in California, maybe uh, tens of thousands here in New York. It's just, it, it's about the culture, and so we need to push people towards policy that really centers that. So that, that issue definitely resonates with both of you. Um, Let's turn to another issue that's related to this massive transition that we're undergoing from oil to electricity, and that's jobs. Mm. Um, if you look at uh, New York State doesn't produce much oil, doesn't have a, a large companies based in the oil business, yet we spend, depending on the year, 20 to $25 billion collectively, so that's government, businesses, private citizens, buying oil from other states and other countries. So think about this effect. We're going to switch that from oil to electricity. 85% of that is generated in New York City. We do buy some from Canada. So that will create jobs here. That will create jobs in renewable energy locations. It'll create jobs in infrastructure. It'll create jobs at mobility companies. So the question 
for, for you is, uh, how do we capture that? How do we ensure that New York City benefits from that and, then, and this massive transition that's happening creates jobs in New York City? Um, uh, well, we could start with, I mean, these are, these are gonna be good green, and I'm gonna say union jobs. I mean, this is a union town. Uh, we have very, very strong organizations uh, who have come in, who were fully supportive of right local law 97 and that transition. And I bring up the Climate Mobilization Act because it's incredibly ambitious. It, it was when we wrote it. And when it passed, it was a really big deal in tackling what we call dirty buildings. And so we have to do the same for transportation. And we certainly have many, many uh, groups and organized labor who we know have to get on board. And like you said, the investment alone at every level of government, and you can see it right now with a conversation that's finally happening at the federal level. And I know that we're fully against any undermining of, of the EPA, right, the Environmental Protection Agency and what kind of transpired with the Supreme Court, but what they're discussing at the federal level in terms of that massive investment finally happening after so long, um, that is gonna create fantastic jobs. And that's also gonna create um, this opportunity for, for a pipeline of training, of people who are, they're going to college, they're gonna need, uh, we're gonna have to look at um, how we're creating these hubs of workforce development. And that's gonna be in these green jobs and, and, and all sorts of biotech and, and alternative energy. And when you mentioned earlier, our involvement in renewable Rikers and how we re-envision uh, these pieces of, of property of land specifically that are owned by the city and what we could do to move forward with, with offshore wind. And there's just so much there to unpack and, and we're really excited to be a part of it. That's what she said. Uh, <laughs> no, I, it's I, gonna pay it, well. It, it, it has been part of, it, yes, there are some very op big opportunities to, for good paying jobs here yeah. in the city, I think based on the conversion to new industries and the green industry. I think we have to make some decisions about how much we're gonna wrap our arms around that or not to create those jobs. But, I think that is one promise that, especially the, like, la the labor movement has seen as a, a real opportunity for them. Uh, talking again about the bill now, a tactical uh, question. There are now 27 sponsors. Um, so uh, what do you foresee as the next steps? And uh, you introduced the bill less than five months ago. Um, what are, what are its prospects? How are, how are well, you both you, feeling? You, you missed one important detail. 27 is now in a majority of the city council. 51 members. 51 members, so 27 gets us, we were at uh, just a few left under that about a week or two ago. So now we are over the, uh, uh, the sponsors. Which by the way, it always could be an undersell having people really wanna vote for in support of it. 30 set, 34 overrides or prevents a mayoral veto. So we're still wanna to work towards that. Look, very few bills accomplish that many sponsors, uh, and especially that fast. And what we want to do is obviously the next steps would be get that to a hearing, and then obviously, based on how the hearing goes, uh, hopefully get that to a vote. And we, by having that many sponsors at this point in time, in year one, only a few months into the bill, is very good news and very good, good for its you know, opportunity to prospects. And I, should, I want to mention that you guys in Circle have been extremely helpful in building that support, strategizing around it, putting out op-eds, things like that to keep this in the consciousness of our colleagues, but alongside those who are out there in the city and want to know what's, what's happening. So uh, we really appreciate the Sierra Club's partnership on this. And obviously our next goal is to get to 34, get a hearing, and hopefully get it passed. And, I think uh, based on the timelines we, we are laying out here, we want to do that as soon as we can. Well, that's very exciting. Yeah, I mean, it shows what municipalities are capable of. And we know that to, to get a bill passed in New York City, to have a conversation on anything that's, I think, this uh, ambitious, I guess, um, you have to have a pretty big round table, right? So we're bringing in the advocates and the experts and the academics and the unions. and. If we can get all of those people on board, well, then we dare the mayor to try to veto it. Uh, it seems very encouraging, but it's, it's good to hear it from the professionals. <laughs> okay, um, and Council Member Rivera, you touched on this in one of your earlier comments. Maybe we could talk about it briefly. Um, 
the, this bill touches New York City's municipal fleet, so it's the purview of the federal government, not the city or state government, to deal with emissions regarding consumers and businesses. Um, New York State and New York City, as you alluded to, are not leading the pack in EV adoption. So in 2021, just to put a number on it, California registered 563,000 EVs, and in New York it was one-tenth of that, about yeah. 52,000. And New York City accounts for some 44% of the population of New York State. So what can we do better to um, not only address the municipal vehicles, but try to pull the rest of things along to get uh, consumers and businesses moving faster as well? Keith, what would, what would convince you to get an electric vehicle? Well, first of all, we, MTA is going our way. Right, like we, we want to make sure that we're really emphasizing mass transit here in New York City. We should have the best transit system in the world, period. Um, in terms of electric vehicles, yeah, I mean, you really have to, I think the, the, the piece that Council Member Powers brought up in terms of like communication, the benefits, why as a household you can do your part if you do need a vehicle to transition to electric, how do we make it easier, what are the incentives, um, are there some sort of, you know, abatements, discounts? I mean, you can go on the LIE and go in the, you know, HOV lane if you've got that special sticker on your car. I mean, these are like little things that people need to just hear about, but really the overarching message of why this is so much better for us as human beings, for our planet. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, it's communication. It's, I, I truly believe that sometimes you do have to, to, to codify and change, otherwise people kind of get stuck in the day-to-day -day and time will pass before they realize that we really haven't gotten to a place that is absolutely appropriate for, for the situation that we're in right now, which is pretty dire. But, you know, I'd be... Uh, yeah. I, I was also just, like I said earlier, like the infrastructure, because I think a lot of New Yorkers, I've talked to New Yorkers who wonder where they're gonna charge their car and, where, and how they're gonna do that, and if, especially if you're in an apartment building or something like that. I think you're seeing some of that pop up, but I think that's one cost, and obviously the federal government's, uh, I think you know, based on the new legislation that uh, mm -hmm. the President Biden signed does provide some opportunities or, or, or abatements for people to be able to uh, buy, buy those types of vehicles. So I think there's the incentives, and then there's like the logistics of it, and, and just to, to adjust costs and things like that. And I, by the way, I, 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 as you said, the, something like the HOV lane, like I actually don't, don't still think the HOV lane really encourage people to carpool. <laughs> but I do think actually there could be some interesting ideas about how you encourage people to convert if there are added incentives, not just the cost of buying it and things like that, but if you do provide. Because I, I know people who recently have bought hybrids or electric vehicles, and, and cost was such a big part of it with the rising gas costs and things like that. But so trying to weigh out those, those long costs. I, I, I think you, know, you have to make it affordable and you have to make it easy, I think. Okay. And I think those are the two biggest things for New Yorkers or Americans, period, that are gonna help them convert. Okay, we're, we're approaching seven. I'll do two more questions and then we'll do the lightning round, which okay. is kind of fun and fast. Okay. Um, this one is one I'm particularly curious about. And, um, so in general, uh, recently, Democrats have been fa in favor of measures to limit environmental harm and tackle climate change. And your colleagues across the aisle um, have not, um, but this wasn't always the case. So President Nixon, who was Republican, established the EPA um, during the George H.W. Bush administration. The, the U.S. established the world's first cap and trade system, and um, that was for uh, acid rain, and it was very effective. And that, that problem really affected New York State in the Catskills and the Adirondacks, and per the EPA, it reduced um, SO2 reduction, so sulfur dioxide, 93%, and uh, NOx emissions by 87%. So that, great, that, that program worked, and it was a bipartisan program. Um, but it seems to be hard to find consensus across the aisle at the moment. Are you seeing any signs that lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are, are worried about climate change and are willing to work together to prioritize various types of programs, perhaps here in New York City or at the state or federal level? What are... What are you seeing? I don't. Uh, I hate to be the pessimist here. I think it's the Democrats who are really going to be leading the charge when it comes to climate change and protecting our uh, our our you know, our country against the adverse impacts. And I think that's a partially based on uh, who the leader of their party is, which is still Donald Trump, who uh, not only eroded important regulations and protections that were and took us out of international agreements, like. I think it would be refreshing uh, to see. I mean, look, Mike, Mike Bloomberg was our mayor, he's Republican, and he did, and I did believe in that. 
but he's not the Republican of this Republican Party right now. So, and he's not a Republican anymore anyway. And so I don't have a lot of confidence that particularly at the national level we're gonna see this until perhaps their communities maybe lying on the waterfronts in Florida or something else are gonna start feeling the real negative impacts and then by then it's probably too late anyway. So um, I think that, I think it's, I think what we would be wise to is to try to talk about these issues in a way that does bring in a bigger tent. I don't think we should, I, you know, like, like we, 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 administrations change, parties change hands, so we do have to build them into the conversation, but I don't think we've seen a lot of encouraging signs in the last X amount of years mm -hmm. to show that there's gonna be a reception to what is a pressing issue. And it also, I'd say, falls into the trap that I said earlier, which is Democrats also sometimes are not acting with the urgency that's required based on what we are seeing, because when it's time to act, it's already too late. Yeah, I, it really depends on, I mean, I know what happened in Washington and with Joe Manchin actually being from a state that's very dependent on coal, that was a very interesting development, but I thought that was sort of just, that was rare, right? That was kind of a, an astounding sort of stunning moment right. where everyone was incredibly thankful, but I don't think we're gonna see those over and over and over again. It's just not, not gonna happen. And so I think that's why this conversation is so important because what we can do on the local level, you know, expanding emission-free uh, public transit, strong federal sort of clean car standards, protecting states' authority under the Clean Air Act to adopt these sort of state-level uh, standards, that, that's, that's what's gonna have to get done. And, and hopefully we'll have that, uh, that political uh, will in, uh, on national level in Washington. But um, do we have any Republicans on this bill, 26 sponsors? I don't like, think so. I don't think so. But that's well, not, you know, that's not totally out of yeah. yeah. Is this a, is, is like, I try to think of this often when people say, well, what, what do you think that, what is a bipartisan issue um, that we can feel accomplished on? I, I, I wouldn't say climate change either. I just. Okay. I don't All right. That. That's disappointing, but. But um, I remain cautiously optimistic. Okay. Okay, don't worry. We have to. All right, one, one last general question and we'll do the lightning round. Um, Council Member Rivera, you, you're sponsoring this bill and you've in, introduced environmental legislation such as creating a greenway master plan and promoting yeah. bicycle use. Um, what general comments would you like to make regarding transportation, climate change, and the role New York City sure, can love, play? I love transportation bills. Um, so yeah, we have the Master Greenway Bill, which is an idea that started 100 years ago, but really hasn't been revisited in the last 30. I think 1993 was the last time we really looked at a greenway plan, which is to create a citywide network where it's actually very friendly to pedestrians and cyclists. So that bill is moving along. We expect to pass it uh, by, uh, by next month. Um, so I've introduced that with the Chair of Transportation Infrastructure, Sylvina Brooks Powers. But I also have other bills um, in terms of creating the Office of Active Transportation, which would really focus on how we create this better streetscape, this more livable city that focuses on mass transit and really would aid in that conversion to electric vehicles, I think, more quickly. Um, and I've really just been someone who's tried to look at, well, how can we look at the grid and figure out something that's greener and friendlier? And so. It's been a heavy focus on alternative uses of transportation, active people-powered mobility. And so um, it's been a lot of fun. I love riding my bike. I take the bus all the time. I'm on the train constantly. So I think it all has to be sort of this very multi-pronged comprehensive effort. Councilmember Powers, uh, you introduced this specific bill, the Zero Emissions Vehicle Bill, and a bill to create three organic waste drop-off sites in each district. Uh, I particularly like that. Um, I try to I try to do that. And are sponsoring environmental legislation such as the goal of zero waste for New York City by 2030. So similar question, what general comments would you like to make regarding transportation? Yeah, we have a, pick a package of legislation, like a zero waste package in the council, which we had a hearing on. We've built a lot of support for with a couple of colleagues. And we are hopeful we're going to pass something uh, soon that would actually put those in not just be bills, but make them the law of New York City, which especially with composting, but recycling, we, we, are, we have poor, poor showing when it comes to recycling relative to other cities here as well. 
the logistics are so important. Like I, I come back to this, making it easier for people is a really big part of that, having it e easy for people to do, tackling some of the information gap. Composting particularly feels kind of gross to people. It's like food crap, that, but you know, popularizing and educating people about what it is and why it's important is really, is really uh, a big part of that. And, uh, and having the, uh, you know, the public government do as much as we can to lead the way so that others in the private sector can then follow suit is and tackle the challenge that need to be tackled so that it's easier when we when all a big part of that. So uh, I'm really hopeful we're gonna get those passed and we've been working very hard on them and getting them to I think hopefully a, a good place to pass. Excellent, that's wonderful. All right, we're nearly done. So now we're, we're gonna transition to uh, the lightning round questions. These are questions in general that are yes, no, or maybe answers. Okay. You can always uh, explain your answer if you like, but it's a kind of a fun way to end things. Um, but uh, since uh, we're towards you know the baseball season, I mean baseball players get a few warm up the swings. House divided. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So here, here are just a few warm up yeah. ones for you. Um, I checked last night. Both the Mets and the Yankees are likely to make the playoffs. Who are you betting on for will go farther Ooh. in the postseason? M Mets or Yankees? E T S. Mets. I think the Mets clinched the playoffs. I, was like, uh, I am a diehard Yankee fan. I was at the game last night, and I'm hoping our judge hits number 61 tonight, so I'm going to go to the Yankees. Okay. We've got a, got a split but there. I, but I will say, actually, by the way, <laughs> but, I, but I will say this. It is better when both teams are doing Like, I'm not a trying to be one serious. of those guys, but it is serious. actually exciting when both teams are really fully invested. It's, it's, it's looking positive for both yeah, of them. So this one, I suspect I know the answer. What borough has the best pizza? Manhattan. Man, no oh, goes, John. I mean. Yeah, we I don't know about it. that. I live in Brooklyn. All right, what's <laughs> what's your favorite movie shot in New York? Ooh, gosh. Um, I'm gonna say something so corny. Uh, like, I really like who got mail. Like, it's like rom com. Yeah. I want to know for the record that's Kay's favorite movie. Who is also? Uh, <laughs> I see the Twenty Fifth Hour, which is a great movie. At Norton post nine eleven. Uh, I mean, Goodfellas. Uh, yeah, I like that one. Godfather. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so there's so many, but uh, yeah. For me, maybe on the town. I saw it with my parents oh, yeah. when I was very young. Delaney. Introduced me to New York. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. So here are the real questions. But I, I think you've alluded to this before. Do you support the MTA's congestion pricing plan for Manhattan? Yes. Yeah, we support it. Yes. Okay. Two yeses there. All right. Um, per a January Bloomberg New Energy Finance report, and uh, and, and Bloomberg New Energy Finance covers climate change issues uh, extensively. In 2021, more than uh, it's 1.6 trillion in sustainable debt instruments were issued globally, uh, setting a new record. And the total market was four trillion. Now, this this question is near to dear, near and dear to my heart because I work in financial markets. So, which city will become the international leader in green and sustainable finance? Singapore, London, or New York? I mean, I have to say New York. Yeah, New yeah. York. I mean, no. Uh, we, I we, think that was a great question. It's, it's important for the city that New Absolutely. York prevails. And um, I really feel like people, like that has to, that has to be part of the conversation. It's yeah, really it's, it's very important. It's one of those things that we can really generate jobs in the city if we, if we uh, take advantage of this transition. Um, this is kind of a fun one. So the ice peak, internal congestion engine peak, occurred in 2017. That's the year that had the maximum sales of traditional vehicles. Every year since then it's declined. So transportation accounts for two thirds of global oil consumption. And so at some point, global oil consumption will start declining. Do you think that will happen in 2025, 2030, or 2035? I'm a pessimist on that one because I think people still love their, uh, I'll say 2030. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. 2030. I mean, it would nice to be 2025. It's right around the corner. The, that's uh, a fairly common guess. Is 2030? Of what course, do you think? it depends. Yeah. It depends. It depends. Do you support a national carbon tax, emissions trading system, or no change to the current system? Uh, I don't. I'm, it's been a long time since I looked at any of those. I think probably a carbon tax. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Last one. Um, you could argue that this doesn't relate to climate change, but I think it truly does. It affects how we Americans can tackle and deal with climate change. Are you optimistic, neutral, or pessimistic about the state of American democracy? It's a far, uh, far cry from it, pizza. Yes, far cry from pizza. I think <laughs> it is, I'm always, a, I'm always an optimist, and that's why, I, that's why I'm in government. 
That's right. I think public service has a great do, ability to do public good, but it's it's stressful to watch the state of the country and the um, state of the sort of discourse right now. And so it's hard, it's draining on that optimism, I would say. And, I, and I've said this before, but I remain eternally cautiously optimistic. And I think how you restore people's faith in government is you deliver on the things that they care about. And issues like this is sometimes as far reaching as it might seem to someone who's worried about getting to their second job and picking up their kids from school. This, this bill, this conversation is about how people feel, their health, who they are, their identity, and how they can not just survive, but to thrive in their city. And that's what New York City should be building, a future for everyone. Good, good place to end. Um, thank you so much thank for participating you. in this event. We very much appreciate your support of this important bill. Um, we look forward to your leadership and getting it passed over, over the goal line. Thank, thank you guys, thank you. Thank you for thank you so so, talking about it. We've gone a little bit over uh, stated time, so I think I'll close it without, without questions. Sure. So we've gone right. a, bit, a bit over. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.